Thank you. Thank you for telling us uh, all about the new policies and, and the invitation, the open invitation for companies to actually participate in the growth of Indonesia. Um, you know, as a, as a business person, I think I can say that business people always are very excited to hear a finance minister speak. Um, but it's also the most frustrating person to listen to because we always want to ask the qu kinds of questions which we know finance ministers cannot answer. Otherwise, we would all, we, you would have given away all the goodies, and that's what we really want to know about. In fact, uh, and, and as a result of this, I think I mentioned to you, I was accosted this morning by quite a number of business people asking me to ask you all kinds of very specific questions about the impact of double taxation agreements on this and that in Singapore and all kinds of complaints about their doing business with Indonesia. And I had said to Ibu Mulyani that I would uh, promise to, to field those and ensure that they wouldn't be asked. And she very, very gallantly said, no, let them ask all these questions. I can't guarantee you I will answer them all to their satisfaction, but I'll be happy to, to field these questions. So please, any of you want to ask anything, no matter how obscure, uh, anything you want to know about the next budget, I cannot guarantee you that uh, she will tell you, you want to know what you want to know, but you've said that you're happy to take these questions. Yeah. So while you decide to pose these questions, or if anyone has the questions, you can raise your hands. I'd like to start, it, start the question by asking you something. And I think on, on one hand, I think it's of great assurance to the global community that you are, in fact, not a new figure to, to the whole financial system in Indonesia. You have been finance minister before. You have, therefore, provided a lot of continuity, which is so critical to economic development. At the same time, you've made an open invitation for companies to invest in Indonesia, which all previous administrations have done. What I'd like to ask you is, could you highlight out of the many different things that you mentioned in terms of attract attractive new measures, etc., what are some of the new measures of the new Jokowi administration that you think are particularly different from the past than that might be more encouraging to FDI? Are there some new measures? Because you mentioned quite a number of them. Well, thank you very much. I think being in the previous administration and now joining the administration, you have the ability to compare. And of course, the current leadership have a much more open and pragmatic in solving the problem. So the issue itself will not change because if you visit many countries in the world, their issue will also the same whether this is on infrastructure, whether you need to open the ease of doing business, simplification, uh, putting your regulatory framework so that it will be uh, positive or constructive for the investment. I think Indonesia is also the same. In, a, in that generic form, it's going to be the same. But what is different is the pragmatic and the no-nonsense approach. So as I said earlier, President Joko, we have an experience as a leader of the city, governor, and then become a president. This is really a new phenomenon for Indonesian politics. And that created him the ability to understand, and he, his own background is a business which is not a big business, in which you can easily overcome the regulatory hurdle with your connection. He's just a small business background. And that's why he knows exactly how the feeling of harassment and the difficulty of dealing with the bureaucracy. And that gives a very, very strong pressure for the cabinet ministers, for even uh, political leaders at the local level, that he knows what he's doing. He knows what is exactly the difficulty facing by the business or the people of Indonesia. So in this case, I think the pragmatism is so feasible and in this case has been a, a hallmark for his leadership. The second one is actually really doing by pursuing a very focused approach. For example, when you talk about those people who has an export-import activity in Indonesia, one of the indicators is dwelling time. How long you are going to, like it takes for your merchandise to go up from the ship to then get into the Indonesia. Maybe for Singapore is something which is obvious. For us, that really requires a lot of discipline in creating the SOP and even disciplining all the party which is related to the port management. 
and he's really counting and every day asking why cannot be reduced who's contributing to this difficulty whether this is custom whether this is port authority whether this is police and all those things so he's like doing it solving so the people can really see the result other so this is his strength but of course for indonesia because we are a big country we really need to make a narrative as well as the macroeconomic consistency so at the macro level the fiscal policy supportive without jeopardizing in terms of the sustainability the monetary policy is also accommodative in this case in order for us to be able to create a room for this kind of deep structural reform to happen i think that's hugely encouraging i know that i mean for all businessmen i think people sitting here today we don't need to be told at all the reasons why indonesia is one of the most attractive countries in the world to do business the reasons are so obvious what has stymied many of us in the past are in fact exactly what you mentioned it's not the big big issues Issue. it's the it's the ease of doing business or the yeah. difficulty of doing business on a daily basis and the sort of eradication of all these minor inconveniences which add up to a lot that will certainly make uh, make it much easier for practical business people to really want to do business in indonesia now can i ask if there are any any questions or anything uh, anyone would like to pose in the room any questions any comments from anyone particularly on ppps for example which is Richard. yes please is that is that rick rick yeah Uh, where is the microphone? Thank you. Um, Minister, you talked about your ability to compare um, when you were minister first time, 2005, 2010, and second time in a different administration. Uh, uh, a real, you, you say the issue also, the issue doesn't change indeed. It doesn't. And one of the issues in Indonesia is that historically it has had a useless bureaucracy. Well, you might say useless and venal bureaucracy in some ways. In your own department, can you see, is there any difference now than there was 10, 12 years ago? Because historically, Indonesia's had uh, often had very capable economic ministers, but once you get a little below that level, it's like going off a cliff, and people are out to, you know, make their own side income, basically, rather than do their job as civil servants. So can you, is this getting any better than, uh, than historically it's been? Thank you. I think that's very, very uh, important question. When I started uh, as a finance minister, uh, that was 12 years ago, um, we actually faced with a situation in which the bureaucracy in Indonesia is severely not well paid. So they cannot even live in what you call it a normal life. So when we launched the bureaucracy reform, starting with the Minister of Finance, we actually start asking, what is exactly the normal life? It's just amazing that you are not receiving a salary which make you can live a normal life, but you are all live a normal life. So there must be something distortion in terms of the source, right? So, and that source of income, which is not coming from a normal source, creating all the derived distortion in this case. So, 10 years ago or 12 years ago, the focus is really trying to put the, what you call it, a normal foundation for the bureaucracy to be able to act normally. We are not asking about the performance yet, to just become the institution who actually implementing the policy and complying with the regulation so they not become the source of problem itself. I think in terms of that, we achieve a quite remarkable achievement, meaning that as of now, being a bureaucracy in Indonesia, you're not going to say and excuse yourself saying that I don't receive enough salary, so it justify all those distortion behavior. So that is the progress. 
whether that is going to be translated into performance and commitment of the integrity, that is something that we, from the very beginning, in this case, realize that this is not taken for granted. This is not something of causality. You improve the salary, then performance and integrity is going to be there. So you really have to come up with a mechanism to make sure that they are performing. There are so many structural as well as performance criteria. The beauty about Indonesia, we become an open country. Accountability has become an issue or become a habit or a culture or value, which has been now widely recognized. And another beauty of what you call it, the technology of the handphone or smartphone. One of my, one of my staff in the tax office, he actually served very rudely to one of the taxpayer. The taxpayer cannot accept those kind of level of service, and she took by with her cell phone and make it viral. So this is I even as a finance minister, I didn't shock with that. I actually saying and enjoying that kind of feedback. And I'm telling my bureaucracy, I'm going to encourage all our stakeholder, you mentioned in your opening, stakeholder, to use the technology so that you can help me to discipline and improve the performance. And that is something which I, th I think any leader should do. The openness and opening the feedback loop. You are campaigning more and more, in this case, what we call it the whistleblower channel and all the channel in which people can always complain to us. But at the same time, you don't want to demoralize your staff. Because at the end, you don't want to just humiliate and telling them that you are not competent, you are corrupt, and so on. That's not the kind of leader. That is the easiest part. Actually, you just passing them and telling them that you are useless and what you call it? Fennel or bureaucracy. That's not the way you are going to lead the institution. So it's really an art of how you are going to encourage and building the institution from within. But at the same time, creating a constant pressure from outside by opening. And Indonesia is a big country, as I said. We are not like Singapore, in which you actually have a compact country like this. I have 341 offices, what you call it, for the tax uh, office in Indonesia. 40,000 of my tax officer, not to mention the custom in this case, which we have more than 33 provincial uh, area to cover. So in this case, you cannot always like saying that, okay, I can uh, build the bureaucracy, uh, improving the salary, but at least you, you will say to your own staff, employee in this case, that we as a leader will try our best to provide you what is the necessary for you to function, to give you the dignity and respectability to perform your function. But at, that, at the same time, you also invite the stakeholder and the user to also uh, uh, monitor and pro provide you with the feedback. I think that is more or less. And as of now, you ask me, I think the challenge is different. We are talking about more efficiency. They become complacent and saying that, oh, we've now already good, the corruption is reducing, it's not become a blatant, massive corruption in this case. It can be like case and case in which people can actually still using the system and uh, to enrich him or herself. But it's not really a pervasive system corruption, systemic corruption in Indonesia. But still, that's not satisfy according to what we want to achieve. Thank, thank you very much. I think, I mean, I, I know as a person who goes to conferences, as a business person, we usually hear a lot of platitudes. We usually hear people say, I promise to eradicate corruption within the next few years. And we all sort of look at that and we sort of don't really believe it. I think the way that you have expressed it, where you talk very passionately about how you need to empower people who share the same views, how you have to exist with a huge bureaucracy, and you cannot just condemn the bureaucracy, you have to take incremental measures to support and encourage those people who want to change. That indicates, I think, to many of us, a real desire for change rather than a platitude about change. Uh, Heng Chi, you wanted to say something or ask something. Yeah. 
Can we have a mic, please? I can hear you. But I think a mic would be better. You have to shout really loud to have everyone hear yes. you. Thank you very much. Uh, it's really good to see you again, Minister, speaking at the Singapore Summit. And it's great that you are the finance minister of Indonesia at this time. Now, you have had global experience. You, you're a good economist. And uh, I believe you believe in globalization and free trade. But there are forces of nationalism and is perceived to be rising in Indonesia. How do you resist economic nationalism and the calls for protectionism in your country? Well, Hengsi, I am glad you're asking that question because this is something which when I return to Indonesia, it's not about the Indonesia who actually, uh, I mean, that's one, one part which I'm going to address. But the global environment is actually changing very, almost say, radically. For example, the leadership of the biggest economy in the world, that is the United States. And people really watching almost every day what is actually the leadership of the United States in terms of globalization in this case. And that's really create quite a, a shock, if I can call it in a very mild way. Because people, for a for a policymaker like me, I'm, if I'm going to convince all my colleague minister or trade union or politician in this case about globalization and openness, they can now easily say that why you are still continue believing that a country as mighty, as superpower, as competitive, as rich as United States, they even, even threatening, they feel threatened by the globalization. And why Indonesia, who's still not that mighty and competitive, why you keep continue opening? So the way we are going to discuss with them is actually try to give the evidence. And this is really something, what I'm saying is that the battle to even convince on what is the benefit of globalization is becoming harder, even at the conceptual or try to convince the politician. And that is something that we really need to do more in order to show why globalization and being open is good for your country. For Indonesia, it's actually easy to provide those kind of evidence. In the past 50 years, when we start adopting the openness, I think we have and enjoying what you call it the transformation of the economy. Poverty reduction is always hands in hands with our ability to actually improve the competitiveness and using the global market in order for us to have more prosperity, especially transformation from the rural to the urban. So urbanization and then moving transformation of the economy from the primary activity into the manufacturing, construction, to become now services sector is actually giving us all the evidence that this kind of path of prosperity can only be achieved with the use, enjoying from the globalization as well as being open. But this is not addressing the issue of inequality. And that's why I think this is also true at the global level. I think the backlash of this globalization is that quite significant portion of the population who are not able to enjoy the benefit of this globalization. And the discussion can now shift into what kind of, is it affirmative policy or inclusive policy? What will it take to make all the stakeholder to become now believe that being open is good for us? We are all know in this globalization and a competition, there is always a winner and loser. We always praise the winner, but we never actually address the issue, what does it mean for those who's actually losing from the competition? And what kind of policy to address them? We, we, we in this case, always taken for granted, those the loser will take care of themselves. They are going to find a way. They will get the lesson from losing this competition by actually investing in education, retraining themselves, and then they are becoming and going into the market, uh, labor market in order for them to find a new job. I think that's not the case. 
And this is exactly the policy challenge, which is, I think, faces, facing by many other policymakers in the world. I was in the OECD headquarters last July when we discussed about this. Some country in European telling that how can he explain to his community who's actually facing with a real threat of the same commodity, for example, like in this case, the farm product, which is coming from other country to their country, exactly the same product that will wipe out the production in those community. Are they going to be saying that, well, too bad, you are losing in this competition, you're just taking care of it? That's not the case. And so the, in this case, I think for, for us, to be able to defend globalization, we should be able to come up with a better solution of how we are going to address not only praising the winner, but also the loser. As of Indonesia, I think we've already like coming up with the pressure of nationalistic sentiment is always come in many other countries. In Indonesia, it's not exception in this case. But if you look at the track record of President Jokowi, I was amazed. Because when I joined his administration only three months when I returned from World Bank, and I actually accompanied him in his trip uh, to China at that time. And he gave a speech which I actually feel shocked because I said to all his colleague politician who is in the cabinet, is this really meaning that? Because he's so open and very progressive in telling about how good the openness and competition. He gave an example, banking sector in Indonesia. And he said that in the past, when you look at the performance of the state-owned bank, who always begging to be protected, protected, and protected, look the way they serve us. So he has the picture of the 20 years or 30 years ago, in which the services is bad, the building is bad, the way the, both all, both the place as well as the way they, they treat the customers is not really having any intention to serve better. When we open, and that's make liberalization happen, then they see how foreign banks operate and how people really can enjoy those kind of services then they now know how, to, how bad their service is. And now they're becoming very competitive. Pertamina, that is our oil company, state-owned. The retail that is the gas station in Indonesia was also protected in the past. And then Indonesia opening, and we can see that the, all the gas station, which is built by all the competitor, is always cleaner, better lighting, is all. And then, then people can see side by side. So President Jokowi said, look, this kind of what we call it competition, without competition, it's so hard for you to tell for state-owned enterprises, to bureaucracy, to change. It's only through this kind of real direct combat, if you can call it, open combat, then you will feel the change and you need to change. But of course, as I said, that is one story. Indonesia is always commit, and now we are reducing what we call it the negative list. We are opening all those sectors which is in the past previously closed. There is a restriction about how much actually the foreign participation can actually. We are now reducing and reducing this foreign participation in many sectors in Indonesia. Thank you. Uh, Minister, I think you, you touched upon earlier about uh, um, President Jokowi and his openness and his progressiveness. I think that's clearly well recognized by business people around the world. But I do have to ask you a question that has been asked of me to ask you by many business people. And it's a bit of a concern to them. It's not a specific uh, issue to do with economic policies. It has more to do with ground sentiments, as Heng Chi talked about protectionism. This is a different kind of ground sentiment. And as you well know, this is the controversial case of uh, former Governor Ahok. It has caused a bit of concern uh, in the rest of the world because of the perception that a president who is extremely progressive, um, a situation has arisen, and the imprisonment of um, former Governor Ahok for blasphemy and so on has led business people to feel a little bit less secure as to what is the policy of the administration, what does this one single act mean in the larger context of things. It's not an economic issue, but as you know, business people are also very worried about 
political overtones and so on, and I wondered if you could uh, analyze the situation from your perspective. Well, Indonesia is a big country. Of course, Jakarta is important because it's the capital city of Indonesia. But the, and the democratic system in Indonesia is not at, at the national level, but also provincial level and the district or municipalities. So we have 176 election, local election, and, it's on, and the eyes is only for this Jakarta election and the result. Some people will see, or even in this case, Wall Street Journal two days ago, if I'm not mistaken, uh, also put a story about one uh, district in, in Java, in uh, Western Java, which is actually also becoming seen as a much more Islamic in terms of the Sharia implementation of law. I think what you need to respond to this kind of phenomena. First, Indonesia is a Muslim country. Ma majority is an, uh, a Muslim, uh, re uh, Islamic and religious is a, a majority of the people uh, religious. But from the very beginning when we founded this country or the independence of the country, the founding father, this issue about how you live together in a harmonious way uh, among the ethnicity, race, as well as religion, it's not new at all for Indonesia. It's not just today. It was really at the time when the founding father have to agree in terms of what is going to be the philosophy or ideology as well as the constitution of Indonesia. The preamble or the opening of the constitution at that time was also the aspiration of the Islamic party and population want to insert the words that Indonesia should adopt that for those who actually believe in Islam, they should practice the Sharia. And those sentences deleted by the founding fathers because when some of the aspirations want to put that, other parts of Indonesia, like Manado, Bali, they said that I'm not going to be part of Indonesia if that sentence is going to be, is going to be put in our foundation. So this is just, and even if you look back, even in the 18th century of Indonesia, this issue is not new at all. So what I'm saying is that, like many other countries who's now trying to discuss about what does it mean living in a diversity? And you should not take them for granted that those like, we are unity and diversity. Indonesia have those kind of, the logo in all our Garuda that is the bird, that we are proud of Bineka Tunggal Ika, unity and diversity. You should not take them for granted. This is something that needs to be maintained and continuously maintained by all of us. So this Jakarta phenomena is actually waking up all of us about what does it mean. Does it mean that Indonesia really want to go to that direction? Was it because of one, one sentiment that, it, that is going to be a trigger for all others. What Indonesia can promise you, that we are a country with the ideology which is open and diverse. And it is in our constitution. It is the commitment of the leaders. Even after the AHOK election, in this case, after the Jakarta election, a lot of the most state sent, uh, speech in the past, uh, what you call it, Independence Day this year, Many leaders now reinforcing the need for all of us to maintain this diversity. The legal structure, the law enforcement <laughs> is going to make sure that we are going to be able to maintain this kind of diversity. So I really don't want you to projecting one election, local election, as if they are representing the whole Indonesia. I'm sure that there is always like people who think that this is going to be a precedent for others. But for me, I think as a Muslim also, Indonesian Muslim, I don't feel that this is really the case. So it's, it's, you should ask whether this is the case from the people like ourselves who live there. I think we still believe in practicing the religious in an open, harmonious way, side by side, different religions, different ethnicity, different race, which for Indonesia is very important because we are very proud of our diversity. Thank you.
Thank you. We, we are coming to the end of the session. I'd like to close with one final, somewhat more personal question. If you look around the room, you can see that there's not a lot of gender equality. There's a lot of men with dark gray suits and a few women with <laughs> brightly colored outfits. Um, and I wanted you to answer this question because this year, uh, as I mentioned earlier in my remarks, we have a whole group of young people with us, young societal leaders. Uh, ESM Go has met with them and talked to them. Many of them are young women, uh, young women from Egypt, from Indonesia, the Philippines, and they are all going to be future leaders. I think they, many of them, they're all here in this room in, in particular. I think they look to someone like yourself as a great source of inspiration. And I wondered if you could just close by saying a few words about the challenges that, that you faced as a woman, as a leader, and what words of encouragement you might want to give to other young women leaders today, how to succeed uh, in the world, and what they have to do to be truly become equals and make this room in the future, next year, a much more brightly colored room than all of us in dark gray suits. Well. I'm glad that uh, you have all this hope that next year summit you are going to have a more balanced gender in this case, in this room also. And also especially for the, the, the youth that you are invited in this meeting, I do hope they are also balanced in terms of gender. I think my advice is going to be uh, being a woman and pursue the, the, the career in this case. Uh, definitely not easy. I'm, I must say I'm not saying that everything is easy, rosy and manageable. Uh, many books has been uh, put in uh, by many of the those successful uh, business women or leaders that it takes twice or more for a woman to achieve the same level. It is because just the nature of those the society which is dominated by a male in all almost a sector financial sector especially also and and that 's why my advice first being a woman, if you are pursue career. Just make sure when you are assigned by a task or responsible responsibility, you deliver that. Because you are not going to be actually analyzed whether you are a woman or a man. If you can do your job, then they will say, oh, she's good. Of course, then they then ask, despite a woman. Mm -hmm. That is something which is not really nice, but that is always, oh, She's surprisingly good. She's surprisingly talented. She's surprisingly capable. So you should really perform. That is non-negotiable. Because the, if you fail, it's not only you who's going to fail. They are going to just reinforcing the stereotyping. See, I told you, we should not giving this to the woman. I mean, that kind of thing, like it or not, still there. So you, you really have to perform, meaning that you have to prepare. And I'm sure many women having this kind of responsibility, they actually preparing harder or twice harder than a man in any position. Um, I know that Christine Lagarde told me, even Angela Merkel, they always prepare much more rigorous in any meeting in order for them to be able to lead, to direct, to be effective in this case. So that, that is more important. Second, I think you really have to, what you call, uh, use the strength of being a woman. I think the, the, as a gender, we are different biologically, of course. And that means that we have the ability to multitask better than men. I mean, the man is always like one focus because they never like think about many things about it, just think about their job. And, I mean, being a woman, it's not because they love and enjoy to think so many things. They are forced to think to many things. First, man is not pregnant. We have to be pregnant. I mean, that makes you not experiment, uh, experiencing something, which is, I think, re force you to become juggling, in this case, biologically. So that will train you in a way that there is a strength of being a woman, that is multitasking and empathy. It's much more natural for a woman to be empathy. And in my, in my experience in an organization, especially when you are in a very highly competitive ego, is very high, being able to introduce this empathy in the right measure is give you a much, much human face and a much better performance of the organization. I think I experienced this when I was in a university, I was in a minister, 
in which I have 72,000 people under me. I was in the World Bank with the 15,000 all over uh, the world. You put the right degree of empathy with a certain ability to multitask, I think that will create a much, much better value added. Not to mention a lot of research telling that having a woman in your board will create a much more diverse and, diverse and rich uh, value and discussion. It takes uh, two, two tango in this case. So it's not only women, but the men should also really have the ability to respect that. And I think this is really a struggle for a man. I think the civilization is going to be much better when the men can see women in a way that they are going to respect as if that this is creating a difference, but actually enriching the performance of your institution. A difference, but it doesn't mean that they are minor or less quality and so on. We are not the same as men. I will always differ from a man. And that's why I'm proud to be a woman. And I think the last one, be confident. Don't, I, don't also overplay, but just saying that being a woman means that you are different, but not overplaying it, just focus in terms of the delivery. With that, I think, of course, the support from the family is important. The society is sometimes providing you more constraint, uh, higher constraint than a man. And sometimes institutions also not always welcome, or, or in this case, is providing a, a, uh, an environment which is always uh, totally positive for a woman. So you are facing with a much uh, bigger and higher uh, hurdle, but I think when you perform, they will appreciate you more. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much. I think your, <laughs> ladies and gentlemen, we've come to the end. I think, I think I can truly say on behalf of everyone in the room that at one level, at the personal level, you have really given words of inspiration not only to women, but a lot of food for thought for us monotasking men, but at the policy level, at the policy level, I think your leadership of the finance ministry in Indonesia has given everyone a tremendous confidence in the future of Indonesia. Thank you for coming today, and thank, thank you, you so for much. enhancing uh, the Singapore Summit. Can we all show our appreciation again for thank Ibu Mulyani? Thank you.